and the book itself, so Gold is How to Become a More Effective Coach Quickly, is basically what the title says. It's just strategies and tips and tools that you can use to become more effective at what you do. And it's and my dad and I just had a conversation. He said, look, we're going on other people's podcasts, and while it's great, why don't we do our own? If we can add value, if 10 people buy this book and 10 people get value from it, then great. And within the first, I think it was like 24 hours in, it became a number one bestseller, and it was a number one bestseller for the first 11 months. Let me bring you back to the beginning of your footballing journey. Where did it start and how did you become a, a parent? So basically from, from the moment I was walking, I was actually playing. I uh, came from a footballing background. My dad played as a pro um, and then went into coaching, which I'm sure we'll talk about during the podcast as well. He's, he's still very heavily involved in the game and my mum actually played for England. So two parents that were both footballers, they both played at a at a pretty high level, especially my mum. I'll say more so, but I'll give her the shout out on that one. So I think from an early age, I was I was playing and being around my dad, who was, who was still at the time very, very involved in the game. Um, I went on to be a player. I, I played in the academy system in England and um, played as a, as, a, as a scholar at Wigan. And to cut a long story short, I think from the age of 16 to, to retiring at 25, I it could just couldn't stay fit. That was really the the story of my career in terms of surgeries and injuries, et cetera, et cetera. And my body just wasn't able to take the, the strains, the stresses and strains of the game. And I think, unfortunately, some people are in that, that boat where they're just not able to play at a... At a, at a high level full time so um, obviously I I think if I was able to stay fair I'd probably still be playing now but uh, the fact that I'm not obviously opened up other doors for me and that led to, to coaching So you mentioned your parents uh, your mum obviously played as, as you kind of mentioned and then your dad uh, was influential in terms of maybe your coaching pathway can you just maybe describe how important they are in terms of your transition as well as you know your playing career as you, as you mentioned um in terms of supporting you and, and kind of helping you in terms of your upbringing to to kind of have a career within football yeah I think the relationship that I have with both of them I think obviously from a parent standpoint I, I couldn't have asked for anything more um at times obviously challenged me and 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 push me to be the best version of myself but they were there constantly in terms of support and love and just really being present in in my childhood um there's I, I could barely remember a game where night where both of them weren't there together they wanted to be at every game at every session they wanted they just wanted to be there just to watch and obviously with them both playing and having a lot of experiences with that comes the the I guess from a standpoint of just being fortunate that they could share their experiences with me and, and help and try and push me in that that phase. And I think at the same time, you know, when you look back and reflect on it, I think there's moments where they probably said stuff to me and I wasn't really receptive to it. And then you look back and really register the messages that they were delivering and realize how important they were. So from that, from a kid and, and even now, my dad's my best friend. There's no question about it. He's the first person I call um, when I get done with a session and that was as a player as a coach now uh, so we speak every day and my mum obviously is the I mean she's the most important woman in my life um, and the, the things that she's done for me I, I couldn't really express and from there really I, I think the one thing that I had from being a, a player I had an identity and it was something that I struggled with the moment that I had to stop playing and I, it wasn't really by choice I had I had hip surgery and couldn't carry on I really had a hard time struggling with my identity because I felt like I was immersed and wrapped up in this thing of me being a footballer. And that was hard. And, and my parents obviously helped me through that process and just making me understand that, you know, you're not you're not just the footballer. You, there's more to you than that. And I was coaching before I actually stopped playing and that obviously would, it helped me, but it was still tough because I just wanted to play. Um, 
So the, the, the transition itself, while it was challenging, I think if they weren't around, it would have been way, way more difficult than it was. And um, I think when I was able to, after I'd had the surgery and knew that I wasn't going to play again, I got to a point where it, I was able to deliver and be on the grass and do more. And I think the time can be a healer. That as time went on, I, I really grasped the fact that I wasn't going to play again and wanted to be the best I could be at whatever it was I did. I actually, before I was coaching full time after playing, I actually I had a pretty successful business that did very well, um, that branched outside of football completely. And again, my parents were there for that too. So my dad's done a lot of business mentoring and having him around and in that for me again was was a huge part of it but now as a coach i mean my mom's my mom she's just super supportive and she just wants to listen and cheer on and all that kind of stuff and my dad's probably more of a sounding board and someone that i would go to for advice or that he would come to me with with tips or little things that i need to do better because the reality is there's a lot of things that i need to do better and i'm fortunate that he's there to help me with that in terms of that transition, then, there might be people or listen, people that are listening or watching this podcast that might be going through transitions, whether that's in football or maybe other career aspects. And you mentioned the word identity and being wrapped up in your identity and maybe dissecting down who you are as a, as a human being and thinking about other avenues. What advice would you maybe give to people that might be going through that process? Because by the sounds of things, you had support mechanisms in terms of your parents, but there might be people that, don't have that is there anything that stands out during that process that is 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 valuable to share yeah initially obviously very very tough because it was just i was so immersed i want to be a footballer and this is it's been taken away from me why can't i do what i want to do and i think the first part of it was stepping away from the situation and not like when you're so immersed in it you can't see anything else other than that situation and when you step away from it and look at it as it's not why is it happening like why has this happened to me but it's happened for me so it happened for a reason and I can't control I can't control why it happened and I can't control all the things that went before me but I can control what happens now so yes it, it it's very unfortunate and it something that I didn't want but I can sit here and talk about it and be really upset that I'm not able to do that or I can go okay what's done is done and at this point now what can I do to move forward in the next part of my life whatever that may be and and again be the best version of myself whether it's coaching whether it's business whether it's as a dad or a, a husband whatever that may be that I don't let this part this small part of my of, of what's happened impact the rest of my life and, and that was something that I think throughout my life, I mean, I had so many injuries, surgeries, et cetera, et cetera. And I was very good at co compartmentalizing those things. And again, I put it down to the the support system that I had where there'd be moments where I'd get a, I got a freak injury. I broke my arm in training. I had a, a really bad it, um, break. And um, that first probably day is like, why has this happened to me? Like, it could have happened to anyone. Why did this happen to me? And the day after, I was pretty quick to be able to go, you know what? I can't control this situation. I can't control the fact that I've got my arm in a in a cast and I have to go and have surgery. What I can control is what I can do from now to get back fully fit and be better than I was before that happened. So control the controllables is kind of the key emphasis there in terms of that. In terms of your coaching pathway then, so that transition happens and then you find a new intrinsic drive in terms of you being a coach. Talk to me about how you develop yourself during that transition and what things did you did you learn during that, that process of becoming a coach? I to be honest, Christy, when I I didn't at no point early, early on after I in that transition I, did I have intention of coaching full time. Okay. So it was actually quite interesting. I'd my dad, even though he's very heavily involved in the game and has worked with England internationals and at some of the top academies around the country and, and worked with England national teams and as a coach developer too, um, he'd never 
had lots of opportunities, but has never coached full time in the game because he didn't want to. He just felt like it took all of your time. And he'd always said that to me, the game's a thief. It'll take whatever you give it. And a lot of the time it will take as much it'll take everything from you and you might not get anywhere near the amount of reward back from the time that you put into it. And that kind of sat with me for a for a while of financially what are the benefits and long term is it going to be something that I want to do and I think the longer it went on I start I was obviously coaching and I was I was doing a lot of uh, a lot of delivering but I had my business and I think only when I I actually moved back over to I moved over to to the US in 2018 and only when that happened and I was started to deliver more and more and started coaching full time was it a thing that I thought you know I quite enjoy this and I think I'm good at it. And this was at the time I, I think I'm pretty good at what I do. And with that being the case, it was at that time an element of look, if I immerse myself in this, can I be exceptional? And obviously that is something way down the line and, and something that I'm striving to be um to, or to get to every day. But it was it was never something that I set out to do right at the start. It was just something that I think organically happened. And the more I did it, the more I thought, you know, I, this is something that I think I can I can push myself to be very good at. And obviously now I'm, I, I am absolutely full-time. I'd say I'm full-time times two uh, in terms of the hours that I work. And I can absolutely relate to the comment that my dad said about it being a thief because it will take everything from you. And sometimes you might not get as much back. But I, I do thoroughly enjoy what I do. I love what I do. And... Um, yeah, there's lots of challenges, but it's it's certainly certainly I think when you do get the rewards, they are they are great. You mentioned the transition from the UK to the US in 2018. Talk to me about the the differences, maybe in culture. Did you have you had to adapt maybe certain methods, different styles? Obviously, culturally, there's going to be a contrast and difference between different continents. Is there anything that you've uh, you've learned during that process of how to deliver uh, and educate others? Uh, within obviously a footballing setting or a yeah. soccer setting, <laughs> yeah, soccer setting. Yeah, we're gonna use that one. Um, I actually, I actually was over here before. Then I was at here 2011 to 2016 ish as a player, so I had an understanding of the culture. Um, I think the big part over here is it's such a big place, and every state somewhat is its own country. And in terms of culture, you go to different parts of the country, and they're all completely different. So when I actually did move out here, I, I'm in Utah. Um, again, the culture was completely different to what it is in the other parts of the states that I'd lived in. I think the one thing that I will say is the kids are they're just more respectful. They're easier to work with. I, I, the Very, very rarely do you have a kid that is extreme, like, I don't think I've really come across many that are really disrespectful kids or really, really challenging to deal with. Um, I think the other side of it, the, the probably the challenge that you face is a lot of them don't grow up immersed in the game because a lot of them are probably first-generation players. So the families have never played, or if they have, it's just the parents, and they don't really maybe have a, a true understanding of, of the culture and the game. And being able to probably give parents, absolutely parents, an understanding of that, um, and especially at high levels, an understanding of what it takes to become a professional footballer um, or to become in America as well a, a Division One athlete because a lot of them are chasing the dream of getting big scholarships without a true understanding of what it takes to get to that because you can't just turn up and train and do your thing and then go home and do it every week and then expect that just because you do that you become a division one athlete there's way more to it and i think if you look in england for example it's undoubtedly pretty much everybody's life well there's a lot of people's lives revolve around the sport from a fan standpoint from a kid growing up from kids just go out on the park and they'll just play football because that's just what they do because it's the norm and over here, you probably have to draw that out a bit more. You have to give them more of an understanding of it, of what it takes. And of course, there are kids that are absolutely just intrinsically just so driven to to get to those levels. But there's others that 
probably don't have anywhere near of an understanding of what it takes of of they do of kids in cultures where that is the number one sport and what the life revolves around. It's interesting how you mentioned parenting and first generation. Is is there an element of kind of from looking at looking at it from like a welfare perspective that the the parents let the players just play and there's a lot of, a lot of freedom in comparison to maybe the UK where you mentioned that cultural element and the the social f- fabric element of trying to become an elite footballer because it's very much part of our DNA within the UK. Is it, is, is, do you ever see differences in that regard? I'm just intrigued on that, just in terms of what you said. I wish they just let them play. I wish right, they, okay, but no, right, okay. Um, I think. Look, but I think regardless of where you go anywhere in the world, you'll get you'll get both. So in the UK, you'll get the parents that do just allow them to play. You'll get the parents that'll be running up and down the touchline, screaming and shouting. And obviously, I think that is a lot of a, a big part of that is what you allow in your environment. If you allow that to be um, something that grows, it'll grow and it'll be poisonous for the environment, not just for that child, but probably for other children too. It's the same thing over here. Um, I think the reality is parents as a whole and this is i guess if you were to put them all in in a category they know less because the game isn't as popular over here or they've not been brought up in the game so you'll have people talking about it but they don't really have a true understanding um and and look you get that in england too i don't think there's any there's no doubt about that but yeah i wish they just let them play um i think it's something that will probably go on forever in terms of obviously parents living vicariously through the children playing the sport and wanting them to be a pro kind of like i talked about they want them to be a pro and they want them to do this now nah, but probably also don't understand the the impact that they're having and the negative impact that they're having on the children by pushing them when they probably don't need to be pushed yeah absolutely and again it's just a conversation that i had with a few colleagues earlier uh, in the week and also obviously you see a little bit more of an emphasis on well-being especially you know in cases such as the Delhi Ali interview that came out and I know it's a different perspective but it's again kind of focusing on that intrinsic drive and where that might come from and other factors from youth development that could impact that in terms of longevity just to add to that then Dave so if I think about maybe how you approach that as a coach is there anything that stands out in maybe your attributes or your skills or your philosophy towards soccer in america that you've developed over time or maybe you've had to to change and modify depending on for example some of the cultural things that you mentioned and um being a player and, and that transition as well and your other mentors such as maybe your dad as you said is, is there anything that stands out in terms of what you want to be as a coach i, I want to be someone that people can look at and think that, that i care about them first and foremost and and that they know that I care about them and they know that I'm willing to do go above and beyond and do extra for them because I am and and I will and and have done that and will continue to do that and I think that's that's first and foremost I think that goes obviously way beyond the, the the tactics or anything like that that I want you to be the best you and it's not just about on the field so really big in terms of about the standards that that are being set so look if you're gonna rock up and go through the motions in the session i'll be on you and i'll be on you pretty hard because i set the expectations with you at the start and a lot of it is about look what do you want to be i want to be a pro okay you want to be a pro if you want to be a pro you have to expect that i'm going to hold you to that standard and if you drop below it I'll let you know. And again, this depends on the level of the players you're working with. If you're working with what they would call in America rec kids, the, so that the, the lowest level where they just want to play for fun, great. And what do you want to do? I want to enjoy it. Great. Well, if you want to enjoy it and that's why you're here and that's the expectation, then my standard is to obviously help you as much as possible, enjoy this experience, and I've got to tailor that to you. Um, but in terms of the player's that, that I work with, you'll ask, what do you want to be? I want to be a pro. My next step is to be a pro or my next step is to get a D1 scholarship. And again, like I've said, if you fall below that, then 
my responsibility is to tell you. And if I were to allow that to happen, allow the, the, the low standards to happen, I'd be failing them as well. Because if you're going to tell me that and I don't hold you to it, that's on me too. And I think the standards you set are the standards you get in those moments. And it's important that that I, I am able and capable of letting people know and that I go back to the stuff about letting them know that I care about them and that I'll go above and beyond for them. Well, if they know that I care about them, I think I'm in a better place to let them know if they drop below. Um, and it could be anything as simple because, like I said, it's not just on the field. If you rock up and you waltz in and go through the motions in the session, I'll tell you there, but when you leave and if you leave your trash, the, the rubbish and all the bottles or whatever, and you walk past um, things that need to be picked up and you don't do it again in terms of being a person i think that's about just being a high quality person because that goes way beyond the on the, the field or way beyond the game and the vast majority of players i work with they're not going to be pros we know that they know that we've told them obviously they can have the want and and the will to do that but they won't but if we can tee them up for the next part of their lives, if it's not football, if it's they go into business or they go to college or whatever, that they can take some of those lessons about being a high quality person. And I think that is success. Yeah, definitely. I think just just to add to that, I think the, the transferability of skills you mentioned on and off the pitch is important in terms of uh, the, the key pointers within that point. And also you mentioned defining what success is. Do, do you ever feel like that you have to maybe we well over time have you redefined that because you mentioned that not many make it so is that something that's kind of changed over time for you as a coach yeah i, I think i think success is relative um i think in terms of success it's who are you working with what age are you working with what's the level what's the expectation and having an idea of all of those things then gives you the the scope to define what success is and yes it changes I, I mean i one of the groups that that we have we've got an under under 20 group well the next step for those boys is either to go and sign a pro contract or to go to college and i know there's there's a lot of there's obviously people talk about results well if results weren't important we might as well just take the get the the two goals of play possession so results are important it's not to say that we have to sit here and say you have to win every game and if you don't win then you you failed because losing a game and learning from the loss is is could be deemed a success as long as you're able to implement it over the next however long so i think i think it's relative i think again if if you look at who you're working with what age the level etc cetera, etc cetera, and what the expectations are i think you're at, you you define success through that and yep. and obviously it can evolve and it can change over time um, because players can improve and their expectation might change, what they want might change. Um, the level, of course, may change. And as they get older, things become more important to them. And um, I think just having an understanding of that and being able to evolve and adapt with with the situations as they kind of go on is, uh, is important. In terms of what we've mentioned then, so thinking about values, standards, um, adaptability, defining success. Is there anything that stands out over the last couple of years that have, uh, that has challenged you as a coach? Is there anything that um, you can kind of elaborate on in terms of what challenges you faced? And the reason for that is that um, there might be listeners um, or viewers of this podcast that are inspiring to maybe be a coach or are a coach in a certain age group, etc. Could you maybe talk about maybe some of the challenges that you face and how you dealt with them? Yeah, fuck. Every day. Every day. Challenges every day. Trust me, it's... I think the big part of it is, look, we're all human. So we're all going to have difficult days. We're all going to have challenging days. There's going to things. There's going to be things that happen in our lives that may be unexpected. And they can hit you like a ton of bricks. And I think... It's something that I've had to work on, of course, of just being able to compartmentalize sometimes things that happen off the field in your personal life and still being able to be truly present and add value to the people that you're going to be spending the rest of your time around that day or, or that session. And I think, look, if you, you have a fight with the dog, 
and then you leave for training and you then impact everybody out because you've just had a fight with the dog, I think you've let people down. And it, look, at it, you can sit here and say, oh, you, you should do that and you have a bad day. We'll just get on with it. Well, it's not that simple. And it's obviously much easier said than done. Um, and I think depending on the scope of what's happening depends on obviously how easy it is to do that. But your energy can, can really positively or negatively impact those around you. And I look at it and when you rock up, can you be an energy giver and not an energy taker? Because if you rock up and you take energy from other people and, and, and really drain others, you're impacting everybody else. And we're, if you can be an energy giver, you're positively influencing the environment. But it's tough. There's no question about that. Like those, those things that happen off the field that, that happen in people's personal lives are not easy. And sometimes it, being able to give energy that you just don't have because you're you emotionally drained from something, you are where you are. We are all human. And I think as well as that, I think in terms of challenges, you won't always get it right whether that's a game or a practice, whatever it may be, I think the importance of it is being able to reflect on it. And, and it's something that I've, I would like to think that I'm pretty good at. I'm pretty harsh with myself. If I've had a stinker, I'll know I've had a stinker and I'll walk away knowing I've had a stinker. And the first thing I do, if a game's gone poorly or if um, a session's gone poorly, is I look at myself. It kind of leads into the next part of, of what I was going to ask you was, you mentioned reflective practice. Um, in terms of maybe adapting to different types of groups or educating yourself and thinking about different types of learners, etc., is there anything that you utilize? Obviously, the emphasis there was reflective practice, but is there anything else you do to kind of develop yourself if those bad moments happen? Having a sounding board. So, again, uh, I'm very fortunate that I have my my dad to bounce off. So for me, if something, if, if I've had a stinker and I know I've had a stinker, I'll speak to him and it could just be a little tidbit of information. There's other people I'd have around. The, the other person that I work with um, at the club MI is, is, is top. And we have a very, very good friendship and we also have a very honest relationship. Whereas I've, I've had a stinker that day and I know I've had a stinker. I'll ask him for his advice or ask him what his thoughts are and vice versa. When he's in the same boat, he'll do the same with me and, I feel like we have that honesty with each other where we can challenge each other um, and, and being able to to draw from that. Obviously, there's, look, if, if you're talking about reflection and, and being able to see what went differently or what, what could have gone better, you go, well, you have cameras up, you record the sessions, et cetera, et cetera, that you can then reflect from that standpoint. But not everybody's fortunate enough to have that. And if you don't, I think the first part of reflection is being able to look at yourself and and... To give you an example with it, if you're if you've got a game and the team turn up and they're very flat and the performance is very flat and there's no energy, well, the first thing I would look at is why were they why were they flat and why didn't they they have energy? Was that me? Was it the way that I turned up to the to the game? Was it the team talk that I gave them? Did I not project enough energy to them? Did we not get something right in the warm up? Whatever it may be, and sometimes there may not be anything other than look, kids get flat sometimes or they get overwhelmed, whatever it, whatever the situation. But I think it's important that you look at yourself before you then start pointing the figures at others for why things didn't go right. It's an element of self-awareness then in that process. And just to add to that, you mentioned having good people around you. You know, you, you mentioned your dad as a mentor and other colleagues. Um, when When is the moment where you kind of take their advice on board? Because sometimes you might go with gut instinct or have a feeling about a certain situation where you think, okay, I need to re input that. But again, having that sense of reflection and probably emotion as well. You mentioned that in terms of maybe feelings going into training, etc. How do you know when to, to, to turn to those people or, or utilize some of the information that they might give you or at the same time know that you need to maybe trust your own thoughts? How do you find that balance? I think it comes just over time and through experience. I think there was, I've probably been on both sides of it where there was points where I just didn't want to take the feedback and I'd stand my ground and puff my chest out and have the ego and not be willing to listen because feedback can be hard to take, especially if you've not done as well as you could have done. And 
look, you can reflect personally. And I think it's easy to do it yourself and or easier to do it yourself and say, well, I, I need to do this better. But when someone else tells you it's hard, especially when it's what you do for a living. And I think with that through experience, sometimes previously, like I said, I'd not want to take any of it because the ego was hurt. And then sometimes I'd want to take all of it. And really the situation or the context was a little bit different than needing to take all of it. And it is, it is an element of, of over time. What do I think the situation needs if it was to, if it was to happen again and what part of the information that I've been given is, is beneficial. And I think if you look at the best, like the best, best in the world, so we'll take Pep as a great example. This past year, see you on the treble, but I think people forget that at a point they were struggling. Struggling. I, 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 don't, I don't think they were struggling, but they were struggling in terms of what the expectations were for them. And there's lots of stuff that had been talked about around how Pep adjusted and adapted during the year, and he actually took a lot of stuff from Desert Well, you could argue that Pep is the most successful and the greatest coach of all time. So why does he need to take information from other people? Because he's already the most successful. He's already the best. Well, I think that's what makes him the best. I think what makes him the best is his ability to take him for information and know when to stand his ground and go, nope, we're sticking with it. Or know when to look at somebody else or listen to somebody else or learn from somebody else and when to then know that that information or that gold dust is is applicable and and useful for what he needs have you, have you seen the picture of carlo ancelotti um when he turns to his bench stuck in france has a, have you seen that i have i think that kind of epitomizes your point in terms of we we as coaches or as leaders don't need to know all the answers whilst people might think that you are the one to go to it's important to kind of delegate or look around and, and find answers find answers elsewhere i think that's important in terms of what you said yeah, I agree. Do you try? And, do you try? Do you try and uh, do that within your own practice in terms of maybe seeking advice from others and and and, and kind of taking and absorbing information in different ways via that way? Yeah, again, uh, the Scott who I work with, we small staff, the two of us, uh, with the relationship we have, it's great because there's there's been examples where. If he's the lead coach, whether it be in a practice or a game, he's absolutely receptive to me. And he'll turn around and say, well, what do you think? And I'll give him my thoughts. And he he, he feels comfortable enough to say, okay, it's on you. Go and implement that. And I then obviously have to deliver that. And, and then vice versa, it's the same situation where I'm, I'm the lead coach, I'm taking the game. And I look to him and say, hey, what do you think about this situation? What do you, can you watch this and then give me your feedback? And is it worth the change? And he might come to me with something and say, yep. Yeah. And I think with that comes a, le- a, a, a level of trust because you could put hundreds and you could put thousands of other people in that situation or that environment with me. And I probably wouldn't trust them enough to value the information that they give him because I don't know them enough. I don't trust them. And I think being able to develop that level of trust and understanding with somebody, someone and, and it being a mutual thing that really, really allows that to happen. And I mean, I'm, I've said I'm fortunate, obviously, with my parents and my dad. And I think I'm fortunate in this situation that I have a, a working relationship with someone that we both believe that we, we can trust each other and have an understanding that we can push each other to be better and also help those around us. Just on reflection of what you mentioned at the, the beginning of the podcast, you mentioned that you fell into coaching and part-time and... You mentioned America and the different changes of cultures. What is the most report rewarding part of your coaching? What con- what drives you to continue to pursue a career within the environment? Is there anything that stands out that you really enjoy um, in terms of maybe your intrinsic drive? Seeing players develop and grow. That that's that's without doubt the biggest one. Obviously, the level depending on the level that you're at and and whatnot. I think when we have our under twenty three group, I think a big part of that is the fact that we win because it's rewarding to win. It's rewarding to get success, and we enjoy that. But when you see players develop and grow, especially players that you've had with you over a period of time, it's it's 
it's a great feeling. And I think last weekend, last weekend we had um, we had three academy players that were involved in our in the USL game, like they were involved in in what is basically a senior game. As as young boys that started with us when the full time academy started, and they've come through the process with us, and um, it's nothing that I haven't said to to them. Um, they we've we've obviously given them certain tools. We've given them a platform to do certain things. We feel like we've helped them as players, but they committed to the process. They committed every day to to pushing themselves to be in the position that they're in today and when you get when when you see them like one of the boys came on this past weekend and played 75 minutes in a game that we had to win in his debut and didn't put a foot wrong really in that game it was a young it was a young boy that came in and you see that and you, you obviously feel really proud that you've played a part in this person's journey and also super excited because you know that there's more to come. But yeah, I think seeing players grow and develop so rewarding, and I um I get a huge kick out of that, no doubt. And then obviously, look, like I said, I think the higher up you go, if you, if you're going to talk about first team football, the development and the growth absolutely still. And then the other side of it is when you have success from results, because if you're getting results, it shows that the players are implementing and they are growing and are developing in, in a way where they're able to win and get success. I suppose seeing them be good people as well is something, is a, well, it's a part of the, the process in reflection of what you've mentioned about enabling them to grow off the pitch as well. Yeah, that, that, that side of it, Christy, I, it's something that, like I said, the, the vast majority are not going to play beyond a certain level. They're not going to play pro. It is what it is. But we we are big, like really big on, we travel away a lot. Well, when we travel away, we, we cater food into the hotels. And at first, at first, it was a constant reminder, hey, when you get done, make sure you clean the area. And having to look around and check, look, you've just left food on the table. Like you've, you've just had spaghetti and meatballs and you've just left sauce on the table. Not acceptable. Because it wasn't like that when you arrived. To you fast forward... Um, down the line that you go away with the group and you don't have to say a word to them so the food arrives and they're all they're all very respectful of the environment they get done and the, you see boys that are that are wiping the tables down and they've, they've gone and got napkins and tissues and cloths and everything from the hotel staff so that they can clean the area up if there's anything on the floor they're cleaning it up and I think um, when you when you see that side of it Again, I talk about stuff going way beyond football. That's the stuff that goes beyond football because I think having a respect for those around you, for the environment, for your teammates, for the staff, for the hotel staff, you go to the hotel, you should be saying please and thank you because it's important because someone's serving you. And whenever you go through your life, I think having those, the prerequisites, the non-negotiables, you do it, you, you're not going to find yourself here. We've had players that are not here, not with us because they've not done that. And that's football aside, because there could be some extremely good players that just don't get that right. They won't be with us because it's important that the non-negotiables. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good point and an interesting point. And it's probably an area that we don't really see as co uh, as a, a spectators uh, locking in, fans locking in. But in terms of those different aspects to set the culture and and and, and, and an ability to perform on off the pitch is, is important. Um, one thing that I was going to ask you, and a, and a bit of a layer in terms of how you develop yourself as a as a, as a coach and and the people around you, is is the implication of technology and new technolo technology. Um, is there anything that you have utilised um, over the last recent years in terms of developing um, players, but also developing yourself in terms of this area of technology? Because from personal point of view, reading into different methods of AI and all these other factors that are slowly slowly growing in within our society. It's going to be probably an area that continues to advance. Is there anything that stands out from from your perspective that has enabled you to to develop yourself as well as the people around you? Something that I I, I think part of it's from a time perspective and also from a resources standpoint. It's not something that like the AI and the the data analysis stuff. We don't really have 
access to the right. We have a little bit of access, but it's not extensive. I know, look, if you're in the Premier League, there's clubs that use AI and all the data analysis stuff to figure out a game plan to play that weekend. So, um, I think simple stuff. Look, we 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 record uh, we record games and whatnot, and I we we get the clips for from every game and. I think simple things. We've got a tripod and an iPad that we bring to sessions, and we'll we'll show play. We do um, once a week. We do uh, individual work, so position specific. So, for example, if a let's say a fullback um, fullback's got a good matchup, and in in the game he's he gets beat a few times. Well, there's obviously there could be loads of reasons for it, but if we're able to to clip those those little parts of the game and show the fullback and then work with him on those moments that look you were still running at him while the winger had control of the ball you didn't have control of your body and that's why he went past you or look you just mistimed it because you thought that this was happening and and being it so we do that I do that quite a lot in terms of getting clips for, for individual players and being able to show them and and also for for units, we do stuff with the back four. We'll show them clips from games, but and then look, we have the we have the GPS vest, that kind of stuff that that we use. But AI, not not quite, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> give give it a few years there. It will slowly come evolve. Come evolve. Um, it's just interesting. Obviously, speaking to analysts, they they mentioned kind of different technologies, the different uses usages in in different sports, and obviously be speaking to you the person that is in america you know think of other sports in america such as baseball and um, american football like it's, it's very much integrated there so i'm sure you're seeing an ad- adaptation within that um but obviously in terms of technology i suppose for your sake you've been able to, to connect with people through your podcast and and through networking with your book and kind of sharing information in in different formats and different ways um, in terms of obviously the Gold Dust podcast as well as the book, can you kind of just maybe give listeners a, a, an opportunity to understand where it come about and how it was formed in terms of sharing knowledge within the, the field of coaching? Yeah, it, it, it started so that the journey itself in terms of writing the book started in 2019. So I was I was actually going through a visa process. And, uh, my dad and I, we'd, we'd been on a on a course, a language course, and I think I mentioned the stuff about the language course. I think that just having an ability and a scope to to know more than just football is important, and being able to have a a wider span and a wider variety of qualities to your armory is important. And we 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 both went, like I said, on this language course. We came off it, and I was actually heading over to the states for a couple of weeks. My dad was heading uh, heading back up to Wigan. He was in London at the time, and. We're on the phone. He, he he just said, "Look, I want to, I want to write a book." And it's something that I thought about too. And I, without hesitation, I just said, to Sarge, "Look, I'll help you. I'll do it with you." And we knew what we wanted it to be about, and and the book itself. So, goal is how to become a more effective coach quickly is basically what the title says. It's just strategies and tips and tools that you can use to become more effective at what you do. And it's not just for football. It's it's sports it's business and what we did was we got 12 people that we interviewed that are involved in different sports that shared similar values and beliefs and ideas as us transcribed it and then and then compiled it all together so we've got so the likes of 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 mick beals in the book um who's who's now at rangers um a friend of ours justin holbrook who was the most successful I had the best winning percentage of, of any coach in rugby league history. Uh, martial arts world champion who's now a, a, a world, he's, he's now a martial arts coach, a world champ of, of several world champions. So, um, and then Darren, people like Darren Moore, who obviously just got promotion with Sheffield Wednesday. So you get all these people in, in the same room, so to speak, and find out what it is they do to be successful because they've all been successful in their own right and go, okay, what do they do and how do they do it? And how does this match up with where we are at and how we've had success or how we see our, how we see things in terms of 
the language piece of it, the communication piece of it. So like the the language course that we've been on, it's something that, that had been in our lives for a long, long time. It was basically just a refresher. And doing the course basically gave us that little bit of motivation to go, we need to talk about this. Because a lot of the way that you operate operate with people is based on the language that you used and, and impacting people's neurology. So I could say certain things to you and impact your neurology either positively positively or negatively. I could say something to you and put you in a bad mood pretty quick. And vice versa, I could put you in a good mood. Well, if you're able to know how to do those things at that point, you're able to impact people and influence them. And if you can influence people with integrity and influence them positively, then I think you're straight away, you, you, you're putting yourself in a place where, um, where I guess, yeah, where you, where you just can influence. So the book, so that's where the book, I mean, that's really where the book's at. That's what it's about. There's obviously a lot more to it than, than what I've just said. And, but there's lots of tools and strategies and tricks as, as to how you do it. And I think from my standpoint, from a learning standpoint, it was the best learning experience I've ever had because I had to immerse myself in in the writing of a of a book. Um, I did all the writing. My dad would obviously read stuff back and give his thoughts and ideas, etc. And then I'd go back to the drawing board and I'd get back to it and spent countless hours doing it while I was still coaching, while I, I had my business at the same time. So I was obviously very, very busy. But it was worth it was worth every moment and obviously what's come from it since then i think when we wrote it when it got released you'd think oh well is anyone gonna buy this thing is it is anyone even gonna bother that we've wrote is it gonna impact anyone and we kind of looked and said look if if we can add value if 10 people buy this book and 10 people get value from it then great and within the first I think it was like 24 hours in, it became a number one bestseller and it was a number one bestseller for the first 11 months. And kind of pretty hard to comprehend that you've put this piece of work together that all of a sudden around the world is being well received and was being read by Premier League managers and coaches in different sports that are coming to us and saying, hey, we read the book and it's really impacted us. And I think the one, um, so Craig Brown obviously passed away Um passed away a few weeks back now and um he he actually read the book so after it came out he read the book and he came back to us and said if i'd have had this book when i was coaching i believe i'd have been better at what i did because i the impact that it's had on me since then has been like it's been massive so we actually we ended up asking him if he was willing to put that into a forward so we wrote he ended up writing a forward for the book for us and we just re-released it so yeah it, it it's obviously it's very rewarding when you get that kind of feedback and even now look someone will reach out to us that's just starting out in coaching and they'll say look i read the book and it's really helped me and i feel like i'm getting clarity on stuff and it's a great feeling uh I, yeah it's been fantastic when people do that it's still one question that i wanted to ask in terms of writing and the process of writing and i think you kind of alluded to it a little bit then in terms of that imposter syndrome of not knowing where this might go and who's going to buy it. And you mentioned if 10 people buy it, then it's a success in, in, in our eyes. Um, but I presume that was a kind of a trait that occurred during the process of writing. How did you find that? How, how did you find the whole process of trying to get stuff down and trial and error and balancing business, businesses and career in, in, in coaching and all those other facets that take part in, in life? How did you find that? Uh, it was challenging i i've i do have a very obsessive personality with stuff so okay. people joke about it I, I have friends that joke about it my family joke about it like if i find something that i like i'll just it's all it like if i find a chocolate bar that i like i'll never buy another chocolate bar i'll just eat that chocolate bar and i'll probably do it for six months <laughs> and i won't touch another one and i am i'm all in it's either all or nothing so if I'm going to do it, I'll either fully immerse myself in this thing or I'm out. And if I feel like I can't give everything to it, then I won't even I won't even start. And I think during that process, I, the one thing that we, when I did, I actually told people. So I kind of put myself under the gun a bit. I said, yeah, I'm writing this book. Writing a book about this is what it's going to be. I told quite a lot of people. 
and part of part of that was I said that I was going to do something and I'd now told a lot of other people that I was going to do it too and if I didn't then I, I think I'd be looking at myself well, look you failed in that one and kind of set myself up a little bit but I think I enjoyed doing it I think that was part of it too because I think to write something and, and spend so much time on it because there was I believe there have been thousands of hours spent I don't know thousands that might be an exaggeration but there's definitely hundreds and hundreds of hours spent doing something and of course there were days where I'd I'd go in I'd, I wrote the whole thing in a Starbucks and I had my seat in the stand there'd be days I'd go in and sit down and look and go this is this is miles off don't even know where this is going and then you'd be back to the drawing board and I think the big part of it was look we knew what it we want we knew what we wanted it to be about we knew what the end goal was it was just how we got to that and what the overall content was and how you piece that content together in a form where others could read it and I think the the first part honestly was you have to pick up pen and write because you can have the idea in your head but if you never pick the pen up or nowadays obviously if you never open the laptop and start typing it's always going to be in your head and it was something that every time something came to my mind i'd type or i'd put it on my notes on my phone if i had a pen and paper i'd just write and obviously over time you start formulating this thing that starts piecing together and and you you finally get to a point where you look at it and go you know what i'm actually pretty happy with this i think we've we've got it to a good place and even after it came out we redid it because we weren't totally happy and I think that's just part of it i don't i think things change and evolve and adapt and again that's part of the process of just being able to look at something and go it's not going to work on this it's still out it's never going to be perfect there's a concept from an author called uh greg McEwen who mentions the term essentialism and what he means by that is if you keep just doing the essential things each day you eventually get where you want to go and i can imagine that's a little bit like your process of just chipping away at it each day. You mentioned the different hours that you put in. And then finally, you have this concept that can be shared and inspire others. So I, I feel like that's kind of the, the process that you went through there. Would you Would you agree? Of course. Yeah, it's... People, a Rome wasn't built in a day. And you, you can't write a book in a day. You're not going to become excellent as a coach in a day. It's something that, that takes time. And... I think when you first, whenever you start something for the first time, the chances are you're probably not going to be that very good at it. But I don't think that's the point. I don't think the point is about being very good at it the first time you do it because Picasso, again, he didn't pick up his paintbrush and just suddenly go, oh, here we go, bang, 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 and create a masterpiece. He had to work on that over a period of time. And I think being able to be uncomfortable, in the, like you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. You have to be comfortable when things are challenging, when you know things aren't great or when you may not be very good at something because why would you be good at something you've never done before? Yeah. But if you want to do it and you want to get to a certain level or a certain point, if you want to write a book, you just have to commit to the process. You have to understand that it will be uncomfortable. You have to be comfortable knowing that. How did the podcast emerge from the book then? How did, how did that? How was that inspired? I presume feedback was this can be shared and then technology in different formats. Uh, I presume that was the process, right? Or was it a different yeah. matter? Yeah, it was. So I did, after we wrote the book, I, I'll be totally honest, I didn't even know what a podcast was. This was, this was <laughs> like the end of 2019, uh, early. Yeah, it was the end of 2019 and we got asked to go on a podcast. Like what? I, I genuinely, I had never listened to a podcast in my life at that point. And from there, we started doing more and more. We got asked to go on more and more podcasts. And, and then COVID hit and the world turned digital. And even we were, we were locked down over here, but it was nowhere near to the extent that you, locked out, you were locked down in the UK and, and other parts of the world. But we were confined to our houses. And my dad and I just had a conversation. He said, look, we're going on other people's podcasts. And while it's great, why don't we do our own and get guests on that we believe will add value to other people? And we're now 18, nine episodes in 
Uh, we release them every other week. We're, it'll be four years this coming spring. Or, or, or are we 20? Yeah, so it's, it's like three and a half years now of, of the pod, podcast being out and us bringing on guests from all over the world, from different backgrounds, from different sports. And selfishly, obviously, from a CPD standpoint, it's been incredible for me because I have the opportunity to be in a room with great people or in a room, so to speak, with the technology. But I have the access to that and can pick the brains and can ask questions. And then at the same time, obviously, we're able to to provide value to people that listen in and want to continue learning and growing on their journey too. Dave, my final question very much summarizes... um, and reflects really upon what you've done um, already. But I want you to maybe put yourself in the future. So when the kind of time comes for you to 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 stop coaching and stop the podcasts and come away from writing, if that's a, another task that you do in the future, um, how do you want to be remembered? Is there anything that, that stands out for you in terms of maybe leaving a legacy or leaving some form of inspiration to to someone in the football or sporting world is there anything that stands out in terms of how you would like to to kind of see your journey proceed yeah I, I, to be remembered as someone who's positively impacted people's lives and obviously the more the more lives I've impacted the better but I think that would be it I think that at the end of the day people can look and go he was a good person um he, he tried to to help others. He tried to do things for other people, and, um, and and impacted a lot of lives along the way. So, obviously, I have goals and all that kind of stuff that 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 I want to achieve personally. But I I think even with all of those goals, etc., I think the one thing that if I put them all together and said, "Well, what's the one thing I want out of this?" It would be that I've impacted people. Excellent. David Mayer, thank you for joining me today. Um, and before we go, where can listeners or viewers find you if they are inspired by some of the things that we've spoken about? Uh, so, um, social media, Twitter, um, that was my DJ Mayer 3, I think it is. Um, LinkedIn. I'm, I think I'm pretty much on all the social media and Instagram, etc. So, yeah, I think if anyone wants to reach out, I'm always happy to have conversations with people and yeah, if we can help, then I'd love to do it. From a personal point of view, thank you. Uh, your podcast and book is very inspiring. Um, and good luck and keep up the good work out in the, uh, the United States. Thanks, Christy. Appreciate it.